What is the future of AI in symptom checking and digital triage? Well, that is what I am discussing with my guest today. So I've just finished chatting to Piotr Ozhakowski, and he is based in Poland and the CEO and founder of Informedica, and they do patient symptom checking and digital triage. Now, uh, Piotr has been programming since the age of seven, got really into programming games and gaming, uh, and then found himself building what was the Polish Dropbox, which went on to uh, be sold to a super large web company. Um, but then it started building this symptom checker, which is what he has now at Informatica. Now, he's really plugged into what's going on in terms of the AI world, the large language models. He's got views on how that might be brought into this space obviously needs to be much more regulated and possible to regulate than it is now. He talks about some key challenges of things like large language models and how they might enter as regulated medical devices, albeit incredibly difficult and a few years off at least. But we talk about that, which is super interesting. Um, and yeah, just what he sees as the future of the space. We actually talk a lot about values too. He's a guy that talks about some super key values here for him like so humility transparency respect integrity support uh, honesty transparency quality so many of these things which are just integral to how he wants this company run and how he uses values as a framework for other people making decisions so he doesn't have to so that everything kind of reflects the way that he wants things done um, along what is or what sounds like a very beautiful framework for exactly the sort of workplace that you'd want to be in uh, it's a really nice episode this like really enjoyed it um, really enjoyed speaking to Piotr and uh, yeah looking forward to um, yeah all the good stuff out of this one so I hope you enjoy it Hey everybody, this week I am joined by Piotr Ojakowski and he is the founder and chief exec of Informedica and that is one of the leading AI companies dedicated to improving the process of preliminary symptom analysis and digital triage. So Informedica's goal is to increase healthcare accessibility, minimize the rate of misdiagnosis and streamline costs of providing quality care. Their platform has been used by over 13 million users worldwide and is offered to insurance, healthcare and telemedicine companies. Piotr is an energetic IT entrepreneur with a strong technical background, key interest in digital health and machine learning. And before founding Informedica, had several startup ventures prior to this. So Piotr, welcome to the Health Tech Podcast. How you doing, man? Hi, James. Thanks for having me. Doing great. Excellent. Excellent. Um, of your 32 countries that you're currently in with Informedica, which one are you currently in? Where are you speaking to us from? Yes, I'm actually in my hometown, which is Poland, Wrocław, one of the major cities Lovely. west south of Poland. That's when I was born. And this is where we are headquartered. Lovely, lovely. Nice to be at home, I imagine, because uh, how much traveling do you have to do to those 32 countries? I bet you, uh, I bet you know the inside of a, of a plane quite well at this point, <laughs> inside of a hotel room. <laughs> I, I wish uh, I knew, but actually what happened in the past few years is I no longer travel that much, you know, but we have Excellent. our great uh, business team and they travel. They do most of the traveling. Sometimes I miss traveling a little bit, so maybe I get an opportunity one day if the marketing team allows me to do that uh, in future. <laughs> but at least I uh, take this uh, and I use it as an advantage at home so I can spend more time with a baby. Beautiful, beautiful, and congratulations. Um, so listen, man, uh, yeah, the way we start these episodes is we get you to tell your story. Obviously, there's there's quite a lot in this. Uh, previous startup ventures, IT entrepreneur, healthcare, everything that you're doing now. Um, I don't know, you've got a vision of the future with uh, some interesting uh, AI and large language model stuff. But yeah, we're going to get into all of this. So uh, yeah, why don't you start at the beginning, man? Why don't you tell me your story? Sure, I would love to do that. So I started programming at the age of seven. My dad, uh, he's a scientist. He would bring old computers to our house. So of course I only did some super, super simple programming with basic, but this is what my mm. dad taught me. And 
since I was uh, a kid, I, I developed this huge passion or interest uh, in computer, ga computer games. Uh, but I wasn't that much interested in playing games. Of course, I, I, I liked playing, but I was much more curious about how they actually work. So I always wanted to build computer games. And really, just from the moment I was a small kid, I always dreamed of building games and being a software engineering uh, engineer creating different new kinds of games. Um, so long story short, when I went to university, I was already working in the gaming industry. Um, you know, that was like my first job was actually uh, writing code for Java Micro Edition, which is like a super old uh, programming framework for like, if you remember old Nokia phones, these were the kinds of games we made. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. And that was also the first uh, time I came across startups and uh, new companies because I was like joining one company, then another one. These were like super, super, you know, small studios uh, uh, created by some entrepreneurs around the Poland. But I, it was fun. It was fun. Mm. But at the university, uh, I studied uh, software engineering um, and management. And this is where I, where I encountered something even as interesting as gaming, which is uh, clinical decision support systems. Um, so I, I remember I took one of the classes that was focused on expert systems and AI. And I was super intrigued by neural networks uh, by Bayesian modeling, by rule-based system, different kinds of approaches that allows you to mimic the way humans think and solve different problems. Um, so actually for the past 15 years, I've been studying, researching, and actually building decision support systems, what we do at Informatica at our company's also uh, a clinical decision support system. Uh, I'm really happy to talk about it more. And after I graduated uh, from university, I had something else uh, at that time. I was, I co-founded a, a, a Polish, uh, let's say clone of Dropbox. So there was a file syncing service in the cloud. I was the CTO. I came up with an algorithm to sync uh, files between your devices and cloud, which I have to say was really difficult task. Uh, maybe if you use Dropbox, it feels and uh, so simple and easy, but actually it was like pretty tough algorithmic uh, challenge to create something that can, you know, reliably sync and upload and download your files. It was a very tiny startup. Uh, I was a small shareholder, uh, but it was also a good lesson. We sold the company to the largest web portal in Poland, and then I was looking for something next to do. I already knew that uh, I'm not so much into bigger companies or, 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 or corporates. So I was, you know, I already had this, I think, entrepreneurial vein inside of me. And once upon a time, I think it was back in 2010 or 2011, I came across this online version of a game, online version of 20 questions. So probably you know what 20 questions is, like you think about some, for example, famous character, and the game asks you questions about this character. Is it a boy? Is it a girl? Uh, is it like the real character or something fictional? Uh, tall or short, and so on and so on. So I was playing this game. It's called Akinator. Uh, if you haven't played it, I highly recommend it because it's fun. And I was playing this game with a friend of mine who, who is a medical doctor. And we were so intrigued because this game was so smart. Like whoever we were thinking of, it was always spot on. And even more, it continued to improve over time. So every month, people played like millions of sessions against these 20 questions and it just got smarter. So we were super intrigued and I asked a, uh, a friend of mine, hey, do you think we could apply this concept of ever improving 20 questions game uh, to something useful, to something that could help people, not just entertain people? And that's we came up with, a, uh, with the idea that maybe we can switch the domain. And instead of asking about characters, we can ask about symptoms. 
And at the end, we try to guess the most probable symptom, condition, diagnosis that the patient might be having. And because if you think about checking your symptoms online, of course, we are all familiar with so-called Dr. Google. This is what happens when mm -hmm. we go online. You enter a headache, you end up with a brain tumor, you are really stressed, you don't know where to go, you, you get even more confused. And this bias is real because you are a medical doctor, James, but if you don't have mm -hmm. certain knowledge about how conditions manifest and what symptoms Absolutely. mean what, it's really easy to get anxious and act accordingly to your stress. So, mm -hmm. um, so we came up with the idea of 20 questions kind of inspired symptom checker app that would effectively help people and replace Googling online. Uh, that was a long time ago, but this is how uh, the history of Infomedica started. In 2011 or 2010, just so you know, uh, it, the, the situation in the startup scene in Poland and funding and resources we needed even to, 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 to take off was completely different to what we have today. There were like almost no funds, no accelerators, no support, no people with experience building digital health technology. So we were kind of alone. But uh, what happened there is uh, due to some knowledge I gained at the university, uh, I knew where to look for information. I was thinking that maybe I can replicate these 20 questions with a very large probabilistic model, a Bayesian network. So I refreshed my notes uh, and tried to build something on top of the medical content that was provided from books uh, by, by, my, by my colleague Anya, uh, who's a medical doctor. And as I was researching this topic, I was uh, exploring different... Uh, Mm, software solutions that can help me model a very large network. And this is how I came across with the online community of the University of Pittsburgh. So they have like a dedicated decision support lab. There's a forum and I posted some technical questions about, you know, performance issues or optimization of the network structure. And I saw there was a guy from University of Pittsburgh who responded to me with something very clever. And the nickname that he had was Adam, like just Adam. And I'm like, Adam, this name really sounds Polish. He must be from Poland. So I, uh, I found his email because it was linked somewhere. And I wrote to him in Polish. Hey, maybe you can help me with this. And guess what? He replied in Polish. Turns out he was <laughs> actually from Poland for, for whatever reason. Uh, this decision support lab had like many people from one of these particular cities in Poland, they were doing PhDs. Uh, but this is how I came across uh, Adam, uh, our, our scientific co-founder who helped me uh, build the scientific foundations uh, behind Infomedica. And uh, maybe shortening the story a little bit, in about a year or two of working in a garage, uh, we had a very early prototype of this 20 questions app, and that was enough to attract some very first investors with very, very tiny money on very, very bad terms at that time in Poland <laughs> to kick off. That's a great story, man. Um, and some good honesty there about the first investment and bad terms. And actually, that might be something that we chat about. What is this decision support lab? at the University of Pittsburgh. That sounds really interesting to me. Is that something that still exists? Is that something that was set up relatively recently? What on earth do they do there? Like, that sounds pretty specialist and pretty useful for healthcare. Uh, yes, James, absolutely. So uh, in full transparency, I don't know what's the situation right now with this lab. Yeah. Uh, but I know that at least a few years ago when I checked, it was up and running and they had really decent scientists that specialized in probabilistic modeling. It was not only about healthcare problems, but uh, different kinds of problem solving topics. So just so you, so you have a good reference, so Adam, uh, my co-founder, he at the times of uh, this lab, uh, when, when he was uh, doing the PhD over there, 
from what I recall, he worked on diagnostic tools for the for the aircraft industry. So, for example, for diagnosing oh, aircraft. Oh, cool. So sometimes maybe when you fly, you see that there is a thick cable plugged into the nose of the aircraft, like a very thick cable. You know what's going on over there. Aside from other things, they're downloading diagnostic information. And there are Bayesian networks that analyze different parameters and calculate likelihoods of different failures. And they optimize uh, servicing based on the data you get. So they were working on that kind of solutions. They worked on diagnostic tools for the US Army as well. Um, I think something around Intel chipsets optimization at some point. So incredibly interesting things. I know there were like a bunch of spin-offs from this lab. So definitely you can find super talented people who work there. Interesting. I want to ask you about the Polish Dropbox, for want of a better phrase, uh, that you built. And you built a syncing algorithm which drove this whole thing, which you said wasn't easy, but you achieved. And you sold that to the largest web company. What was driving you at that point? Because I can understand that beyond that, yeah, you go and discover healthcare and what you can do in healthcare and you use the resources that you've now built from this exit to go and attack healthcare. I'm interested though, because obviously, was it was it the... You seem to be really keen on technology, right? You seem to be really keen on programming. You've, you, it was programming from a very early age. But how did you come across the problem to solve that led to you building a syncing algorithm for what you've described as a Polish Dropbox? What was driving you to, to build that company at the time? How did you find that problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe uh, just to clarify, it wasn't me founding the company. I was invited after it started but it was oh, sure. through a friend of mine. Um, uh, let me explain maybe for a second. So my friend, Tomasz, uh, who, he founded a number of uh, gaming companies I joined previously. Uh. And he always carried me from one company to other, one company <laughs> from another. Okay. Like, at that time, uh, probably because of certain um, technical or programming abilities, I, I lost them, by the way, throughout <laughs> the years. But uh, but when he got funding for this new, as you say, Polish uh, Dropbox, he thought that uh, he thought that hey, we have a super super challenging issue over there. Like we don't we are building Dropbox, but we don't know how to sync files. And this is when they called me. I think probably mm. originally. It, he didn't plan to hire me, but he was like, I was like the last resort maybe of how we can fix this. Uh, and it worked, but I have to tell you in terms of what was driving me, I think it's a very good question. I think at that time it was still at the university. Uh, I was driven by such a huge and complex technical challenge. I just felt mm. I have to solve it. I remember I was I got like obsessed with this algorithm. It took me like a month or so to solve it, so it wasn't easy. But I remember I was sitting on every lecture uh, in a bus, in a tram, uh, whatever like type of commute you like. Like I, I was I was literally drawing, throwing it out, putting that into my head, and uh, finally it clicked. Finally it clicked. So I was super super into solving, and you know maybe showing to myself that I can solve it and maybe we can do it in Poland as well. Dropbox shouldn't be the only platform doing that. And in 2000, it was 2010 or even 2009, that was the case really that Dropbox was not even in Poland at that time. It was like just maybe basic, basic version, like the first version of, of Dropbox that entered Poland. So we had the potential to offer something new on market. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. Something came to me then when you were telling that story. I've seen a video recently of, uh, you might may or may not have seen it, but it's of uh, President Obama and someone's asking him about leadership and about careers. And they ask him, I think, and I might butcher this, but they ask him something like, what advice would you give to people in their careers that have high aspirations that want to go far, something along those lines. And his answer was learn how to just get things done because everybody, mm. or there are lots of people that can describe a problem really well and 
and talk around a problem really well. But if you want to go far in a career, just learn how to get things done. Now, in the story you just told, it sounds like you were connected to what's, what, what seems to be a very successful entrepreneur there that was jumping from company to company, idea to idea, building different companies around different things. Yes. But it seems to me that you made a name for yourself there as someone who could just get things done. And actually, the learning that you can go through when you attach yourself to someone like that, you must have learned a great deal. I think it was Thomas, I think you said his name was. Um, what did you learn yes. from that guy? Do you, do you relate to that as like a concept, like similar to what Obama said there? I mean, were you the person who got things done? And if so, like was attaching yourself to Thomas a good idea? And d is that how you learned to be an entrepreneur? You must have seen a lot being so close to someone like that. Yes, absolutely, James. I think this is spot on. Uh, and I think this is very correct. I attached myself to Thomas, to Tomasz. However, it was also like he wanted to take me to different places, mm. to one venture to another. And I think he was always my role model as of the mm. entrepreneur, somebody who starts new ventures. Uh, and maybe we're not that even that much similar in terms of, I don't know, personality or approach, but he has always been a huge, huge inspiration for me. And I'm also super grateful that he carried me over to different places. Like I met him at the very first company, like my first job at the time where he was uh, at the role of a software programmer like me. Uh, but he then converted into being entrepreneur and I kind of followed his early steps, later steps and observed how he develops. Um, what Tomasz, uh, I think I, I'm still really impressed uh, with Tomasz as a person and he taught me a lot. Like for me, it's one of the best, best salespeople I've ever met. The ability to explain his vision, to carry people, to drive emotions. And he also has this certain characteristic that he's so natural, you know, and so... Um, relaxed, relaxed. So not, you know, sometimes you meet people who are so naturally relaxed, they can go out on a stage with, you know, 1 billion people listening and they will be so relaxed. They will always improvise. But this improvisation is so emotional, so charismatic. It might be, sorry, it, it might be bullshit sometimes, but, but then uh, <laughs> the kind of emotion you drive is just spectacular. And I think, um, and I, that was always a huge inspiration for me, and it still is. I also, you know, uh, I don't want to get too personal into this one, but I also saw mistakes that Thomas did, and mm -hmm. I understood why they happened. Um, I even, I was even part of like companies where Thomas left, and I stayed for some time, so I had like the perspective of what wasn't working, mm -hmm. and it was also a good lesson for me, you know. Tomasz carried on to like become an investor and VC. So, uh, so, so really good things for him as well. Uh, but he still remains the person I'm, I'm extremely grateful uh, for, uh, for to and um, inspiration. He's, he's from my hometown. Oh, nice. I think that's great. And I think when you are going to attach yourself to someone like that and by, you know, by, displaying a heck of a lot of value I, I think there's benefit in them being a different personality because i think you will learn different things because someone mm. that is extremely good at things you are not you are just going to learn from and i think that's the thing when you're looking for role models or mentors or you can have multiple and they can be good at different things but your job in trying to round yourself off or learn things that you could do better or indeed even double down on your strengths or whatever you're trying to get from these different people I don't think that you need to have the same personality, the same strengths and weaknesses that they're just further on in their career. I, I really don't think that at all. And I think my experience has been that I've learned the most from people that I am different to, um, friendly with, definitely get on with, et cetera, but very different from. And like you said about sales, it was never something that ever came naturally to me. And 
I had to learn my way through that. I had to pick different characteristics from different people to figure out like what's what's genuine to me in the sales process. And the plot to twist there, by the way, like being a clinician as well, like but sales as a clinician is like an absolute nightmare. The plot twist is always like just build an excellent product that you genuinely believe in and then just communicate the truth. Like that's that's essentially my sales technique of just like I'm just trying incredibly hard to build something that's just gonna genuinely deliver value. And that's what I'm gonna communicate to you of like here's yeah. all the value it's delivered to other people, and that's genuinely like my approach. But seemingly, you know, that visionary thing that you talked about, so, so like impressive to watch. And I know some people like that, and I've certainly got some in mind. To your point, though, people that do that through truth, people that do that through less truth, let's say, uh, but still an incredible characteristic to be able to go on stage and do that and to be able to learn that from them and actually what are they saying? What are they preparing? How are they doing that? I absolutely love that stuff. And like I'm, I'm always on the lookout for people that I can learn from in that way. And like to stay humble as an entrepreneur is just so, so, so important. But I want to move you on to the story now the 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 informatica part of the story now um i want you to tell me about the company i want you to tell me like what again about your motivation here like what tell me about seeing the problem that you wanted to solve did you come at this from a technology perspective did someone present a problem to you is this something you came across yourself and how did you go about designing and developing technology to solve this of course i would love to talk about it so james uh in full transparency, I think that the path we had towards building a company was pretty rough. And mm. looking back from where we stand today, I think like it's a miracle that this company exists. Uh, wow. And at the very beginning, at the time of 20 questions game, we had absolutely no clue what we are doing. Even though, as I mentioned, like uh, we got some early funding for our technology prototype on some very bad terms. I think those terms were not that far from reality because we literally, the only thing we had in mind, just like with this file synchronization algorithm, my ambition was to deploy something very cool and enjoyable from the technical perspective and have many, many people play it. That was my whole pitch, you know? Uh, so obviously, this is not how it works in healthcare, and this is definitely not a best foundation for a business model. So what we wanted to do, so the company was incorporated in 2012 in Poland. We got some initial funding because the technical part of our prototype was quite impressive, and we wanted to show, say that we will build like the WebMD for Poland, like the most popular, engaging uh, health portal uh, in Polish. And we wanted to start a portal. We launched it in September 2012 called Dr. Medi. That was the nickname back then. Uh, and it was a, the first AI-based Polish symptom checker. And uh, we were hoping that we'll get suddenly like hundreds of thousands or millions of page views and we will get rich by just showing the ads. Obviously, that dream didn't come true. <laughs> yes, we did have some really nice traffic. Yes, people tried it, uh, but that's it. You know, there was, uh, the traffic was not uh, high enough. Volume was not high enough to support any advertisement-based model. Uh, in terms of, I don't know, offering some services when you see how your symptoms are linked, like the conversion rates that we measured were like close to zero. So that was a problem, you know, that was a problem. So we had a nice technological prototype, but absolutely no business model. So I was kind of uh, thinking how to move from there. And I, I, I came and this is literally kind of the, the level of my thinking at that time. I figure out I need to hire somebody who works at sales and they will help me. So I called a friend of mine who worked at Zara. He sold clothes, you know, pants and everything. And I say, hey, man, <laughs> you need to help me sell it. Now you'll be calling people and like offering, you know, uh, our services to, to, to different, you know, clinics. And maybe we can advertise this way. It didn't work out. I mean, we closed like two contracts, but obviously that wasn't enough to support the model. 
But I never, never gave up. Um, and I, I thought, okay, it's just like writing code. I need to figure th this out. However, how much time it takes, doesn't matter. I need to sort it out. So maybe, um, maybe adding some historical context as well. Keep in mind the company's over 11 years old. So like the amount of stories and the evolution and pivots we have is quite substantial, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, uh, back in the early days, in 2013, I came across an investor from Poland, Piotr, uh, who is a founder of Innovation Nest. This is one of the leading early stage uh, venture firms in Poland. They're based out of Krakow. And he got really interested in, t uh, in what we do. Like he saw that there is some potential uh, behind a big vision that at one day everybody will use AI to to assess their symptoms. So Piotr had this crazy idea that he will take startups from Poland to Silicon Valley so that we can talk to entrepreneurs, so we can you know, network with investors. So that's what we did. So he packed us into a plane. We flew to, uh, to US for a couple of weeks and our only task was to collect feedback, show what we have, talk to different people, go to all networking events, and see how uh, how it's being done in the US, how, uh, how they build unicorns down there in Silicon Valley. So that was a, quite of a journey, first time in the US. Um, so uh, absolutely, I was a, new buy, a newbie, uh, didn't know how to approach it, but I was trying to learn as I, uh, as I moved forward. I showed people this prototype we have around and, the, and everybody, you know, there was like, Piotr, it's so cute that what you build, but I don't think that's a business yet. You know, a very mm -hmm. nice app, but what's your business model? Obviously some hard questions uh, for me to answer. And uh, I kind of, you know, we kind of tried to evolve this idea of, of the symptom checking app. Maybe that should be more like an intake tool before your visit, maybe more like a clinical decision support so you can help GPs diagnose those complex issues such as common cold and bladder infection, you know, and I remember I was, uh, uh, I was uh, in a meeting with, with our advisor, Dr. J Jordan Schlein, great, uh, great guy. And, um, and I was showing him this, look, you can enter symptoms and then you add risk factors. You can even add some, you know, lab test results and it shows you the ranking of most likely conditions. Isn't that amazing isn't that awesome and he's looking at this and he's like Piotr let me tell you something I think it's nice what you have but I don't really need to enter this old data into a computer to see that somebody's coming to see me with cold or flu you know uh, it's not the biggest problem that uh, you should solve and he's like and how much do you want uh, this? Uh, how much do you want me to pay for it? You said like what, one hundred dollars a month? It's impossible. Like uh, I pay sixty bucks per month for access to I don't know uh, what what exactly to up to date. Uh, so what? Why would I pay you one hundred bucks? Maybe if I was like some lonely physician without colleagues, without any friends, I can call without any books on the middle of a desert. Maybe that would be useful, but. Uh, I don't think that will work. So as you can see, James, we had like a bunch of different ideas uh, along the way. Um, and, but again, we never gave up. It's, it was also possible because we had some micro, micro funding that we were getting still from our investors. We also needed to bootstrap because at some point the money was running out. So we turned into a small health-focused software company. We had some clients in the U.S. because I was, you know, I was convinced, okay, it's better to do some custom software for, for somebody than to go extinct, you know, than to close the company. In the meantime, I get more time to figure out our business model. Um, there was a moment I remember that everything failed. I, uh, I maxed out our uh, credit line. I maxed out my personal credit card to pay uh, my employees that the team was like eight or 10 people because we literally had no money. Uh, we literally had no money. And I, I think I used also some money to go to US 
as like the uh, one of my last ideas that maybe I can sell something more, some more services over there, but I came back with nothing. So it was kind of getting depressing a little bit. And I remember that I got an email from a large German company saying, hey, Piotr, we are interested in your company and your technology. We're looking for API that we can use for symptom checking. Would you talk to us about it? I was like, of course. So it turns out they were like really interested. They flew into Wrocław. I gave them a demo. They got really excited. Uh, they wanted to actually buy the company, but I wouldn't sell at that point. But we closed a, a deal for almost like half a million dollars, you know, one deal wow. that saved us. And without wild. this, we would be gone a long time ago. But it turned out they were looking for our technology. They wanted to buy uh, a piece of it, a piece of our IP to drive their own R&D efforts. And that was the deal that saved our company. That was a deal that was a game changer. It pushed us forward in the direction of licensing technology. So before we were like a B2C app, we had like different ideas from clinical decision support to intake collection. But what gained most traction was licensing our API to other tech companies. And this is how we started. Um, we created an API that was easily accessible, the first uh, symptom checking AI powered uh, dev portal that every developer could use. We launched that in 2016, 2017. And timing was also, like in every business, timing was super important because um, in 2016, 17, as you probably remember, James, something big happened in the market, which was like deep mind uh, uh, with the Go our algorithm, you know, defeating, yeah. defeating the, the world's champion in Go. Uh, and, you know, IBM Watson also emerged. So suddenly there was a big wave of deep learning algorithms and everybody started talking much more about uh, AI. And shortly after this deal, I got another email from Allianz, uh, the innovation uh, department of like the world's largest insurance company. They say, hey, Piotr, uh, we looked at your website, at your symptom checker. We want to have something similar, but in German and some other languages so we can embed it into our app. So I was like, OK, uh, I'm not going to lose that deal. Like, and we, at that time, we were the only company with an API. And we, we did literally everything they requested. I think for some period, Allianz uh, driven our roadmap in terms of features, in terms of functionality, and we sold it. And guess what? Like since 2017, they are still a very happy client on board with us. We, we, we continue to grow with Allianz. Uh, and long story short, James, uh, this is how we shifted from a B2C 20 questions game towards a B2B focused, customizable, configurable, multilingual API or framework that you can white label and put as part of your uh, clinical workflows. Beautiful story, man. Beautiful story. I have a few questions because there's quite, there's quite a lot in that for me. I think so much is relatable there to entrepreneurs that are trying to build companies now, or people even thinking about building companies so pivoting, you were told multiple times that you didn't have a business model. And that is hard to hear for an entrepreneur that's got an idea and a vision and passion and energy and excitement and naivety and all those things. To be told that you have no business model multiple times must have been very, very, very difficult to hear. But you also said something, which was, we never gave up. Now, that says to me one of two things. Either you have an, an unbelievable amount of resilience and tenacity to just keep going, or, and or, you are actually coachable as an entrepreneur. You were willing to listen because so often, I think when people are met with that advice and feedback, they might think, well, you just don't understand. I'm the entrepreneur here. You just don't get it. 
And actually, I'm going to go to the person down the road and they're going to love it. But then you hear the same thing from them and the same thing for the next one, the next one, next one. And at some point, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're always pushing boundaries, right? You're all, you always at some point have to play in the arena of people won't quite get this, but I'm the visionary. And actually, I need to tell them what they want rather than ask them what they want. I think there always is part of that as an, entre- as an entrepreneur, which is why this is a, a tough line to walk between, you know, how much do you listen to feedback? Well, yeah, you should listen to it, but probably not all of it. But it seems like you were getting such mm. consistent feedback here about, hey, there is no business model here. This needs to change. But you did say, I never gave up. Now, my question to you is genuinely was giving up ever an option? Did you ever put that seriously on the table of giving up? And was that what led you to bootstrapping, finding another revenue or just a revenue stream of becoming a software company and selling some stuff to just keep going? Was that what drove that? I mean, was giving up ever on the table for you? I feel like I always refuse to give up, but I have to admit that there were times, there was one time back in the early days, maybe 2014 or 15, uh, before we we found a way to bootstrap, before I I get to early contracts, there there was uh, one moment where we considered selling the company to a health company, health IT company in Poland, to an EHR vendor. Um, I'm so happy that this didn't work out. We got, you know, all the approvals from the biggest boss, but they backed out at the very last moment. Wow. So coincidence, uh, but I'm so happy that it just didn't work. It was like, I think 2014, 15, uh, afterwards when we had an opportunity to sell the company, uh, I refused, um, uh, and I always felt we have so much potential and we're just starting when it comes to our vision that I wanted to move forward. And we felt like going B2B with API approach is exactly what's needed in the market. And that was right, at least at that time. Uh, mm. But back to what you said, I think uh, being naive is a very important trait of an entrepreneur. I think I was very naive. Uh, but at the same time, I was, uh, I, you know, I, I always took those foundations of customer development. I, I kept them very closely to my heart. Uh, that was one of the lessons we got from Innovation Nest, our early stage investor, because they said, you know, customers will tell you what they want to buy. And this is basically how we iterated when it comes to, uh, to product. Um, and back to the another very interesting topic that you touched upon, James, um, um, deciding what feedback you take uh, mm-hmm. and what ta- what kind of feedback you keep away from yourself, is that, if I can say this way, I, I think it, it never changes. I think uh, this is something I need to keep in mind every single day, every single month. And if you think about our 11 plus year story, I had to reinvent my role of a CEO every single year. And even today, I need to reinvent my role, my approach, my mindset, my duties every single year. Otherwise, I'm like out of the game. Uh, And it's true. Now I have maybe better tools to decide which feedback is valuable, which is something, uh, which is, for example, against my value system. This is something maybe that's some sort of Wisdom I didn't have back then, but you need to challenge yourself every every day, every year, reinvent yourself. How do you think about scale and how, how have you managed scale? The reason I ask is because the technology that you have is a story that's been told a lot. There are a lot of companies that say a lot of the same words, that do a lot of the same sk- a lot of the same things. You have infinitely more scale almost than almost all of them, if not all of them. So wh- what what has led to that? What has allowed you to scale so far 
in what seems like a relatively short amount of time. Is it the injection of capital and everything that you can do? Do you have any principles for how you enter a new country and hire locally or acquire things? Or how, how practically have you achieved the scale? Yes, so I think I'll say something that might be uh, hopefully not, but maybe somewhat surprising. I think the way we managed to achieve the scale we're at, and by the way, there's still a very long way ahead of us, mm. but, but, but it's true. We have over 100 partners, so this is more than other companies in this space. The way we achieved that was not through funding. We were always underfunded compared to much bigger companies. And starting up from Poland, we never had even access to, to bigger funds. Uh, we were not able to pitch in a, such a visionary way that would even attract uh, bigger funding back then. The way we develop, the way we scale into this 100 plus partnerships is simply because our partners trusted us more. Simply because when we were on a call with them, they felt we were authentic, in my opinion. They felt, okay, these guys are not overselling what they have. They are humble, they are transparent, and they are respectful. You know, so I think a certain element of integrity uh, behind, you know, the company we've built was something that simply convinced our partners who, you know, were entering a completely new field, a very risky field. They want to try a new idea of online triage that they never tried before. They felt that they can trust it and that we will support them. And they were right. So whenever they mm. had issues, whenever they had any problems, we were there to help. And I, I always say that within our company's values, one of our goals is to become the most su supportive vendor that our clients have ever worked with. And this is exactly the feedback we get. Hey guys, we are surprised that you even answered our email so fast and last time. And that's a real quote. Uh, we are so surprised that you took our feedback so seriously. Like the previous vendor uh, would take probably like five to six months to respond, if at all, you know? So I also feel that sometimes, and don't take me wrong, uh, bigger companies, uh, they are not maybe, hmm, they don't have the comfort of being able to focus on their clients because they have so many clients. So because we are smaller also, we can devote more time and attention to serve our partners. But I think what helped us was the, in, the company's integrity and the trust we established. Yeah, which is summarized by essentially the answer to the question of how have you scaled? It's the quality of your service and the experience that you gave your customers. That's basically it, isn't it? Because then that's what you're leveraging into the next sales call and the next sales call. Um, and that's really interesting. You clearly have uh, a very core value set that you personally are seeing enacted into the company, right? Some words that you've mentioned, humility, transparency, respect, integrity, support. Those are just some of the things that you've mentioned. But what I think super interesting, I think you've mentioned this two or three times now, is that you use that value system as a way of making decisions. And so where you are a fork in the road, it sounds like you'll ask yourself, well, what decision respect, you know, respects our values and then let's do that i find that interesting because i think as we're getting bigger with what we do at somex that's how jessica and i go about some decision making not all because it, you know not all decisions can be put into this framework but i think big decisions particularly how things like how do we respond to this situ this complex situation that's happened a relationship between two people, a client and an account manager and us, something's gone wrong. So like that there is some, something that needs to be resolved or something's happened or even, you know, how do we extract the most value from the situation? What new revenue stream can we do? Or what could we like? There's lots of ways where you can end up figure like, how do you answer that question? Well, actually, if you have a core value set, we can actually, we have got a framework here about decision-making because actually the answer to, 
you know, what's the best business decision? The answer is not necessarily the one that's going to make the most money, the one that's going to do this, the one that's going to do that, the one that's going to keep every single staff member happy, the one that's going to keep every customer happy. The answer might not actually be that if you go down a values-based framework for these answers, because what that gives you is not the most revenue, the most profit, the most happy staff members, the most happy customers. It gives you a company that respects these values, which is actually, in my opinion, the route to happiness as a founder and a CEO, because you go into work every day into an environment that gives your values back to you. And it might not be the five extra employees you could have had, the extra two million of revenue you could have put on the top line, the extra few percent of profit margin you could have put on the bottom line like but actually you turn into you turn up to work every day and your values are coming back at you and actually that's a very pleasant place to live and be where you spend 80 percent of your life so i don't know man does that sound about right well james i can only say you nailed it uh <laughs> just as if you were like reading through my notes to be honest but i want to say this Like, I agree 100% with every single word that you exactly said. I think values are like the operating system for your company. You want to run on a single operating system. And it's just the foundation of the decision-making framework. Not only this, but as you said, uh, you have, you know, a growing company, more and more people. You cannot be there to make every single decision, right? But if your team operates on the same system and they apply the same set of values, those values will drive decisions, especially in the absence of data. And you almost never have a full uh, set of data. Uh, Just, you know, this way you'll end up with the organization without your involvement, making more consistent decisions. You can be on vacation and you know that if the choice is between A or B, but you value transparency more, For example, you choose A. Um, I also think it's like a total foundation of the company's culture. As you said, you will build happier teams because you should apply this uh, uh, this set of values uh, when you look for people. Just to give an example, if you value quality, I always, by the way, ask about this during interviews. Mm -hmm. If if one of your core values is about delivering top-notch quality, which is probably, you know, in this case, maybe more important than delivering something fast and dirty, but out to market as soon as you can. And you come across a person who is the opposite, like, no, no, you know, I'm like all into MVPs. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I just want to be as fast as I can. There can be some clash. And of course, there is no good or bad. For one company, this can be good. For the other one, something else. But I believe in a healthcare industry, especially with a clinical decision support product, when the recommendations, the quality of what we do simply influences uh, the the health and risks and well-being of our users, there is absolutely, uh, you cannot, uh, there's absolutely no way you can compromise on quality. Like you need to deliver top notch better at a slower pace than too fast. So this is in terms of the hiring key. Uh, I'm basically repeating everything you said, but something which is incredibly important is you will feel good with yourself because you build a company and you have people around you who know they fit to the same grid of puzzles or whatever, but you will feel good with yourself. You haven't built like a, I mean, you don't want to end up in a situation where you've built a company that pushed your value system to the way where you feel uncomfortable. This is, I guess, what burns out people a lot. And this is, and I think this can happen. I think this can happen multiple times. If you're not careful enough, I guess, uh, or if you allow others to form your value set or change it without full authentic, uh, authenticity, I, I think that might be a very big issue. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I want to talk to you about technology next. And I want to talk to you about where you guys are at now with your technology and a bit about how you see the future. I saw that you guys had um, a webinar. I think it's already happened. So it happened recently um, about AI innovating healthcare, some predictions about the future. Um, 
so I'm interested in in how you see the technology now versus how the techno how you see the technology in the future. So yeah, talk to me. Talk to me about tech. Of course. Um, so maybe I will start with the technology we developed so far. Mm. Uh, starting from this uh, decision support lab at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, that's that's some <laughs> software components that we relied on. Uh, so basically, what we've been developing for over 11 years is a very, very large probabilistic model, which combines different variables, such as symptoms, risk factors, uh, lab test results, and obviously diseases. Uh, we source those relations from evidence-based da data from journals, from books, from patient studies. Uh, we also mix it up to some extent with the data sets we uh, receive from our clients. So for example, they will contribute um, some anonymized data sets so we can improve the scope of connections. And there is also a pretty significant um, uh, effort continued effort of our clinical team. Uh, today, we have 50 doctors uh, in-house not all of them full time, but a chunk of them, yes, who like on a daily basis, they work on curating this knowledge graph. Uh, they work on validating how it performs and they expand the content as well. So we've spent over 80,000 80, hours of clinicians work building and curating this graph and over 8,000 iterations. Um, and this is what we call medical knowledge base. On top of it, there is an algorithm which derives, um, let's say, uh, Bayesian models that can be computed. So based on input parameters, patient demographics, risk factors, symptoms, um, we compute uh, the likelihoods of different diseases and the most relevant questions to ask. So we try to imitate the way clinicians would pick questions so then we can adapt it into a patient triage process, which is basically the foundation of our products. And lastly, there is an API, which is simply a layer that gives you access to both this medical knowledge base and, and the inference engine. So what we have is a medical device, a uh, class one medical device right now. Um, it went through super rigorous uh, safety and clinical testing with uh, around 95% accuracy uh, when it comes to um, uh, common uh, conditions, detecting common conditions and almost 100% accuracy when it comes to triage safety. I think this is important. Um, but primarily it's an expert curated model which requires so much manual work. It's fully explainable. You can understand why we came up with certain results. It's fully predictable, controllable. It's not a black box. However, the work around expanding it and maintaining is, is really tough. It's a mundane task. And this is what we have today. That's the foundation for everything we, we offer. Uh, and as we all know, there is a uh, uh, there is a new situation in the world, a new kid on the block, if you, wanna, if you like, uh, large language models, ChatGPT, mm. MedPalm, uh, all different sorts of language models, which I think is extremely important and extremely exciting. And I think it's a new paradigm in AI that will absolutely change everything, including our company. So... Uh, I, I have both a lot of excitement and a lot of concern related to development of AI technologies. I think the uh, implications might be huge very shortly, but staying within our business boundaries here, uh, this is a technology that will revolutionize, in my opinion, our technological stack and every sort of agent kind of uh, chat-based uh, interaction. Is it like a nurse call center? Is it a patient triage tool? Is it something else? The problem that we have with large language models and everybody by now played with chat GPT or something else, we are really impressed. We're really, really impressed uh, to the extent uh, that it does have a significant impact on our roadmap. Uh, I think large language models, um, like they need to be incorporated immediately into healthcare products, 
but you need to do it wisely because the patient safety obviously is the most important value that we have. There are three biggest challenges that I think are related that are making large language models not so good fit for uh, healthcare just right now. And these are one, lack of clinical validation. So you cannot go to OpenAI and say, hey, what's your liability cap for triaging patients? Is it 1 million or is it 10? What is it? They say, oh, no, no, it's, it's not for triaging patients. So we're like far away from, from this use case. And by the way, there is, for, to my knowledge, of course, my knowledge might be limited, there are no uh, practical ways of clinically validating such a broad model as GPT, mm. uh, chat GPT or something else, because you, have, you can have so many tasks you need to perform. And even validating triage requires an incredible amount of, um, of work. And how do you validate large language models? So this is one. Second one is lack of explainability. So you may end up with, and I, of course, I know companies are working to address that as well, but you end up with some results. For example, you use ChatGPT as a symptom checker. It comes up with this and that diagnosis. Uh, but if you ask why exactly and what led to this result, it cannot be easily recreated. So effectively, it's a black box. Uh, there is also some degree of uh, uncontrollable behavior. You can make a minor change in prompt, and we tested that as well. Or, you know, you use a comma, uh, this uh, here or there, or you slightly change the way you worded symptom, and you might get in a completely different triage decision. So I don't know, let's, let's take a patient with some uh, blood clot or something really serious. If you, you know, if you change the prompt slightly, or if you make changes to your uh, responses, you might end up with completely different results. So those three factors combined, in my opinion, uh, make it really difficult for large language model to meet regulatory requirements for medical devices. And just as a, as a, as a disclaimer, depending on the country, depending on the, uh, on the market, this is uh, patient triage, even if we focus only on this problem, is a medical device, right? Uh, an app for checking your symptom is a medical device in European Union, uh, in Australia, in US, there is some sort of, you know, exemption. So, but I think this will change uh, in some time, I think in the UK as well. So how do you go to those, you know, external entities, uh, regulatory bodies and say, oh, we tested it, we know how it works, we know how, did, how it was trained, it's fully controlled. It's just not. So even though I think this is a new paradigm and I think in terms of conversational apps, much more powerful than everything we saw uh, and in certain tasks, of course, I, I believe uh, much more powerful than even what we have today. How do you go about certifying as a medical device? And can you even certify a product which is based on somebody's API? And if this party is not interested in doing that, then what? So, um, so large language models, you know, really superior in terms of understanding language, this ability of having human-like conversation with elements of empathy, understanding, being able to clarify uh, questions and so on. Multitasking, right? Because it's not only about, if we think about healthcare, of course, there are so many different problems you can tackle within the same chat conversation. Is it triaging? Is it self-care advice? Is it uh, differential diagnosis? Is it, you know, uh, prescription maybe in the future? But the beautiful thing is also being, being multilingual because you can start in English, switch to Polish and then go to German and then end with English. And uh, that's something that no other tools can achieve. However, going back to our work, um, what we provide is, I think, the opposite of what's uh, preventing those tools from becoming just purely medical devices. We have super, super thorough clinical validation, and we can attest, we can guarantee it's safe to use for patient, what we have. We are fully explainable. We are a white box versus black box. Mm -hmm. And with the same input, you always get the same results. So our mm -hmm. thinking, our thinking is 
how do you combine the both worlds? How do you take the best advantage of those amazing conversational abilities of language models, but combine it with a you know, curation or supervision, supervision system like ours in order to meet the requirements of a medical device certification? Yes, and that is the big question, isn't it? I think the way that you've explained that is perfect because you've beautifully illustrated how important, exciting, to use two words that, that you use there, it is, because it is important, it is exciting, but the challenges around regulating it as a medical device remain. There's a there's a regulatory consultancy here in the UK called Hardy and Health, run by a guy called Hugh Harvey, who's, you'll often find him on Twitter, uh, calling people out on lots of this regulation stuff and uh, highly recommend a follow if you don't already. But he, I went for, went for dinner with him last night and he was talking about this a little bit and he was talking about the biggest problem being this, or one of the biggest problems being this lack of determinism. It's not deterministic. The same input can result in a different output. And that lack of determinism is really going to hold it back. And like you said, it being behind a black box and we don't know how it actually works, it, it provides a huge problem and a huge challenge. But it is this thing about how it can be so important and useful. And you look at how th th things are going in AI and more broadly with large language models and things like what Nuance and Microsoft are doing about the transcription and summarization of consultations yeah. and then the automatic agent model of then ordering the bloods and ordering the x-rays and APIing into all the other uh, programs with an action plan that, you know, I can see that when I spoke to, I spoke to a guy called Rob Brisk on this podcast a few, a few weeks ago. He's a, an NHS cardiologist and he's a technologist, so he can build large angles. Mm. He's fully aware of everything to do with large angles from a tech perspective because he's a computer scientist. And he's quite bullish on the fact that, or seemingly anyway, that this will be the future. It's just going to take some time. But this is one example where it can really change everything. If you have the ability to transcribe an interaction with a clinician, that they then don't have to do. Yeah. They don't have to do the documentation. It is summarized. The action plan is there. And then the clinician can look over it, confirm it, and then send it on for actioning. You know, reading it and pressing enter is a lot, and making a few edits is a lot different to transcribe, like writing the whole consultation. And, you know, with the workforce crisis that we've got, is that going to significantly change things? Well, it's still a long way off. It's still a long way off that being even okay to suggest or even pilot or do. And, though I'm pretty sure Nuance and Microsoft are doing something along those lines. I'm sure it's them. I might be corrected by people in the comments, but um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting, man. Like it, it, it's, it's interesting to me. It seems like Hugh last night was saying it's at least five, 10 years away. I think Rob was saying the same thing on the podcast that it's, mm. it's a while away and there are challenges and, and problems to solve, but we can't get away from the fact that we have a workforce crisis. We have the fact that healthcare is unsustainable. We have the fact that technology needs to come in. And so a conversation that arbitrarily shuts it down of like, yeah, here's the three challenges, like you just mentioned. Yeah, here's the three challenges, like it's not going to work. I don't think that's appropriate for people like yourself and myself and Hugh and all the others. I think it is important that we start engaging in this dialogue of like, well, what would it take? How would it be done? How might we do this? And fortunately, as an entrepreneur like yourself, I'm sure that's how you do think of like, no entrepreneur likes to be told, no, it's not possible. There's always a yes if, and actually it's that yes if we're trying to get to. And that's ironically one of our value frameworks at SOMEX is like, you don't, you know, you don't say no, say yes if, and let's, let's write the if down and let's talk about the if, because the if might be possible in some way. I think it's the same with this, you know, like what is the yes if here? What is the yes if, if, if healthcare was completely unsustainable, utterly so, and budgets were cut even more so, and we had to use large language models, how might we do that in six months? How might we do that in 12 months? What, what would we need to do, you know? And I, I like that talk. I like that conversation. And it seems like you might be doing some of that thinking. Yeah, hopefully, you know, I fully agree. Um, if you look at the reports, like by 2030, we will be short of 10 million of doctors, nurses, and midwives. So 
there will be mm-hmm. like such a huge shortage of healthcare professionals. And I really think that without uh, using artificial intelligence, of course, after thorough validation, clinical mm-hmm. validation and, uh, and certification, you just cannot fill the gap. Mm. Mm, definitely, man. Um, before we finish, tell me something that you are excited, apart from this, obviously, but tell me something that you're excited about. What's going on with you guys? Are you excited about something for the company? Are you excited about something for yourself? Are you excited? I know you've got a young family, so that sounds quite exciting. Um, I don't know, man. Like, what, what's, what's exciting you at the minute? What's making you happy? Yeah, many things are making me happy, James. Thank you. Um, uh, aside from those changes in uh, AI space, I think large language models and the ability to combine, let's say, the curated medically approved approach with this new paradigm, I mm. think that keeps us very excited. And that's something we are really, really heavily working on. I'm also excited that um, the adoption or the awareness of exactly the problem that you mentioned, like the shortage of uh, clinicians, like uh, the growing demand, the aging population, you know, 5 billion people might have no access to even basic healthcare by 2030. I'm really, really excited that uh, we are starting to work with uh, government bodies more and more. So we have conversations with Ministry of, of Health, uh, we work even with the Ministry of Health in Poland. So, you know, we can say that like the public institutions are typically take longer to adopt such a new technology. But now I think the awareness is here. And like there are tender processes to to build a clinical patient support system in this country, in that country. So it's really amazing because back in 2012, when we started, the idea behind AI powered symptom checking was like, I, I remember I was in so many meetings, nobody was taking, taking it seriously. In mm-hmm. 2016, they saw, you know, deep mind and other things and oh, something is going on. But now when it comes to supporting patients and patient navigation, I think for especially private companies that has become commodity and for government entities, this this wave is coming coming as well so from the business perspective this is also something exciting i love it man listen piotr it's been an absolute pleasure having you on um yeah i've i've loved talking about this stuff we've covered a heck of a lot haven't we i I think the the interesting thing for me has been no, I, I now know your value framework and I like your value framework and I feel like I can cheer for you from the sidelines now because I know what's going on inside the company and I know that under leadership that respects values like that, it must be a group of very nice people doing very nice things and I, I, I like that. Um, I, yeah, I, I think we're very we're very similar in the way that we prioritise quality and the way that we prioritise those values so I, I do really like that. If people want to get in touch with you, man, whether that's potential new customers, whether that's potential new hires, whether that's, I don't know, potential new governments, who knows, that want to get in touch with you um, and want to find out more about the company, what's, yeah. uh, what's the best way for them to do so? Of course. And thanks, James, for kind words. Um, I'm really happy, really happy and I, uh, that I managed to share also a little bit of uh, who I am and maybe how the company operates. And yes, if you want to reach me, uh, you can find me at piotr at infomedica.com uh, or on LinkedIn. Um, so please reach out to me and I, I would love to talk to you if you have any follow-up questions about after this one.